the past few lectures have looked at gas exchange between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, or the blood. Here, we're going to build on that knowledge and take a look at some diseases and disorders where that gas exchange is impaired, and therefore, we're not able to fully oxygenate our blood. Although it will not be directly discussed, if there's some impairment in the gas exchange, it usually applies to both CO2 and oxygen. So if there's an impairment in oxygenating our blood, there's probably also an impairment in eliminating CO2 from our blood. However, for this lecture, I'm just going to focus on the oxygen. So before we get into some diseases, let's first recall three ways that we can maximize the diffusion rate. Gas exchange between the alveolus and the pulmonary capillaries is maximized by the following. So I'm going to draw a classic alveolus with a bronchial leading to it, and there is my pulmonary blood. So the gradient between the alveolus and the blood needs to be strong. If my gradient is not very strong, then I'm not going to be compelling much oxygen to move into the blood. So to compel more oxygen to move into the blood, I need more oxygen in my alveolus. So I need a strong partial pressure gradient between the alveolus and the blood. So any disease or disorder that reduces my ability to create a good partial pressure gradient is going to impair gas exchange. Alveolar surface area is likewise important. If I have an alveolus that looks like this, that gives that blood a lot of time to really spend with it. So the blood is kind of wrapping and hugging every corner and loop here. And that increased interface time makes it more likely that the partial pressure of oxygen in the air will reach equilibrium with the blood. If I reduce my surface area to something like this, then the blood doesn't spend nearly as much time with it, and that can result in less oxygen getting into the blood. In other words, we don't reach partial pressure equilibrium. We also know that diffusion rates are impacted by the distance between the two compartments. We minimize the distance here by sharing a basement membrane and using simple squamous epithelial tissue. The reason I'm reiterating all three of these is because you're going to see that each disease that I look at is going to somehow make one or more of these subpar. So we're either going to reduce our gradient, we're going to reduce our surface area, or we're going to increase the distance between the alveoli or the airspace and the blood. And so if you understand why each of these particular factors helps maximize the diffusion rates, it's pretty easy to understand why compromising one or more of them results in less oxygen getting into the blood. So let's go ahead and do this. First thing I'm going to do is make a list of the diseases that we'll cover. Go ahead and pause the video and copy this down. So some of these we've already looked at in prior lectures, but we'll build upon them here. So I'm going to start by first kind of drawing that normal. This will be like a normal alveolus and blood. And so fibrosis usually involves scar tissue. So we're going to go ahead and thicken this up with some scar tissue. By thickening this up with scar tissue, we reduce compliance, and therefore we're going to have a lower partial pressure gradient. We can also have a slightly thicker distance, which can also impair gas exchange. 
Okay, emphysema is a double whammy. We have loss of elastin, but we also have a decreased surface area because the alveoli get partially destroyed. So we can draw this kind of like that. So our next one is pneumonia, which is one we really haven't seen before. I'm going to use classic bacterial pneumonia, not COVID-related pneumonia, which I'll talk about separately. In classic bacterial pneumonia, what happens is, is the bacteria end up in the alveoli. So there's my little bacteria. And what that does is initiate inflammation. And when you initiate inflammation, one of the things that you do is you make your capillaries leaky. But here, the fluid is not gonna go to the interstitial fluid. It's gonna actually fill up the airspace here. So as it fills up the airspace, you can actually see that on a chest X-ray. This should be filled with air and therefore it should look black on a chest X-ray and it looks white because it's filled with fluid. So what that does is that increases the distance between where the actual oxygen gas is, so the oxygen gas is largely up here, and how far it needs to go before it gets into the blood. So that increases the distance. Asthma is one that we have seen before. We know that asthma's big issue here is bronchoconstriction. And so bronchoconstriction is going to lead to a lower PO2 and therefore less of a gradient. Edema, which means swelling, can have many causes. Pulmonary edema typically means, for whatever reason, we have some fluid that leaks around the interstitial fluid and can start separating the spaces here. And again, this is a little difficult to describe, but we're going to end up with additional fluid here Usually that fluid will kind of leak into the lungs as well, kind of creating symptoms of pneumonia without having an infectious cause per se. But the end game is the same. We're going to have increased distance. So again, this is called pulmonary edema. There's a lot of causes of pulmonary edema. Very common with congestive heart failure. Respiratory distress syndrome, as we saw with infants, results in the collapse of alveoli altogether. And so when you have a collapse of your alveoli, obviously you're going to have lower partial pressure. And COVID can also induce respiratory distress. It's not quite the same as the neonate respiratory distress syndrome that we see in premature babies. So I'm going to look at COVID in just a moment, but before I do, I want to show you the book's picture, very similar to what I drew here. So you can pause this and go ahead and copy it down if you'd like. 
And then the final thing I want to do is talk about COVID. In this image here, this is actually from a nature paper. This is a normal lung. This is a histological section of a normal lung. In this picture, we can see we have capillaries. There's another capillary. So these are all pulmonary capillaries. And then this is like the alveolar wall. So you can see it's very thin. There's a lot of air. There's a lot of surface area. This is a COVID-19 patient who is deceased, and this is how they get these samples from autopsies, of the same section of lung. And you might be going, what lung? I've actually seen much worse than this, but some of the things you'll notice is there's the blood, there's kind of blood everywhere. You make all of these little thrombi or clots, that's kind of a classic symptom. But I also want you to notice that there really doesn't seem to be like defined alveoli. There does seem to be debris everywhere. You see all this debris. It's hard to see um, on this image, but there's a lot of, those are all neutrophils down there. I'm gonna circle, it looks like a macrophage. There's another white blood cell that I can't really see very well. But there's a lot of white blood cells and then you can see this, this kind of wax-like substance is called hyaline. And it's not the same as hyaline cartilage, but it is um, a, like a waxy proteinaceous substance that's classic for respiratory distress. And it seems to have to do with damage that results from infected surfactant cells. So let's write out a series of events that happens uh, during a COVID infection in your lungs. Now the seed of a COVID respiratory infection is typically the nasal cavity or the back of the throat. And from there, the virus works its way down through the trachea, through your bronchi, and then finally down into your alveoli. Now one of the things that particularly dangerous strains of COVID-19 do is they suppress your immune system initially. And so while we know that our immune system's initial response is to have an inflammatory response and bring out the phagocytes, that should be happening in the upper respiratory tract. But COVID is really good at suppressing that and allowing it to move down into the deeper parts of the lungs where it will eventually get into the alveoli. So when it gets down into the alveoli, there's evidence that it can infect both type 1 and type 2 cells. Remember, the type 2 cells are going to secrete the surfactant. So COVID infects both type 1 and type 2 epithelial cells. And recall that type 2 epithelial cells are going to be the cells that secrete surfactant. Somewhere around day five or six, the acquired immune system finally comes online and we start mounting a massive acquired immune response. But by this time, most of these cells are infected. So think about what an acquired immune response is gonna look like when it's directed at that type of tissue. So remember the cytotoxic T cells job is to induce apoptosis in all of these infected cells. Not only does the immune system have what is called a cytokine storm that induces all of these blood clots, or they're called microthrombi, we also bring out all of these plasma proteins that end up creating these proteinaceous like 
pieces of garbage, and then we start killing all the cells. You can see all the cell debris here, cell blebs. And as a result, our ability to do gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood is completely impaired. One thing that <clears throat> one treatment for critically ill COVID patients with this type of acute respiratory distress is to have um, something called an ECMO, which ends up drawing the blood out of your body and oxygenating it on kind of like a fake set of lungs and then putting it back in. And those are pretty um, effective at preventing death. But one of the problems is, is that even if that's oxygenating your blood while your lungs are looking like this, how do you think the recovery of your lungs is going to be after it's gone through something like this? Pretty terrible. And so one of the issues that they are now finding is that they can't get COVID survivors off those machines because their lungs never really repair themselves successfully. And we might be looking at whole lung transplants because the fibrosis and scar tissue is just so extreme. And so on that note, there is a link between those who have had critical COVID illness and uh, fibrosis. So fibrosis, remember, develops from scar tissue. Clearly there's a ton of damage here. There's gonna be a lot of scar tissue and that causes problems with ventilation and gas exchange.